For those of us who aren't new, I think it's important to acknowledge the amount of courage it takes to show up to a place where people don't know you and you don't know the people. Being new, trying something new in any situation can be downright scary. And so to help mitigate that fear, a lot of churches have a page on their website that says what you can expect on a Sunday. For example, you can expect for worship to start at 10 a.m. Or you can expect a certain type of music or liturgical tradition. Or some even say what you can expect in terms of dress code or attire. But there is rarely a page that says what is expected of you. If you are new or newish to this church, you might have wondered if we expected you to be Presbyterian, for example. Maybe you hesitated coming here in the first place because you didn't know what we expected of you in terms of faith in God or knowledge of the Bible. For the understandably cynical among you, you might have wondered, this church says that all are welcome. But what does that really mean? What do you really expect of me? It's a fair question, especially given the history of the church. Since day one, there has been a lot of implicit and explicit expectations of conditions to belonging in the church. In the earliest version, the requirements were simple, a baptism and a confession of faith. But as the church grew in size and in scope, the requirements became more complicated. Sides were taken, lines were drawn, and answers were given. As a result, the church decided that in order for you to belong to the grand household of the most expansive and creative God, you were expected to fit into an itty-bitty box. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense now, does it? I mean, I guess one could argue that it's for the sake of tradition, right? It's how things have always been done. But logically speaking, if there was one real requirement, one actual expectation of you when you come to church, it really should be this, to have an imagination. Don't believe me? Okay, let's try something. Everyone, close your eyes. Or don't, because no one will know because they're all closing their eyes. <laughs> now, I want you to picture that you are in a very large room with rows and rows of wooden benches, all facing the front of the room where there is an old organ and a wooden lectern. On the lectern is a very large book with incredibly small font, folded open as if someone was in the midst of reading it. Okay, open your eyes. Where were you? In the church. Yeah, no duh. Okay. Uh, okay, now close your eyes again. Now I want you to picture, close your eyes again. It's really quick. All right. Now I want you to picture the face of God. Nope. Too hard. Okay. How about the presence of the Holy Spirit? Nope, that one's a little harder too. All right, how about picture the love of our Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, now open your eyes. That's what I thought, a little more complicated. You see, every time we gather, every time you walk into this room or open YouTube or click on this podcast channel, every time you utter the words of the call to worship or the prayers of confession and the people, every time you take communion or watch a baby get baptized, every time you hear the ancient words of Scripture read, guess what? You are using your imagination. You are, we are calling upon, talking to, asking for forgiveness from and the blessing of a God that we cannot touch or see, but we can imagine. Now, it might not say this in the Presbyterian Book of Order or our Book of Confessions, but I would say that when you come to church, when you come before God, what is expected of you is to have a little bit of an imagination. Lucky for me, Scripture agrees. 
So beloved, hear now this distant passage from a foreign text describing an ancient event that none of us were present at. Imagine with me, if you will, a reading from the gospel according to Luke chapter 13. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on this Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things being done by him. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden and it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again, he said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it, all of it was leavened. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. This past week, I was catching up with my beloved colleague, Ralph Anderson, who had just returned from Disneyland with his wife, Celine, and their two-and-a-half-year-old son, Zion. Now, leading up to the trip, all Z could talk about was how he was going to see Moana from the Disney movie set on the fictional Polynesian island of Montanui a place teeming with natural wonders, including the vast and limitless ocean that surrounded it. So you can probably imagine how excited Z was when the real life, three-dimensional float dedicated to Moana emerged in the midst of the Disney parade of characters. Everyone was there. I mean, we're talking Maui, Moana, Pua, even Hey Hey was there, right? Hey Hey was there, yep. For Z, it was like getting to meet his heroes and his best friends in person for the first time. And yet, Ralph shared, out of all the attractions at Disneyland, including the Moana float, the one thing that caught and kept Z's attention was a tiny little puddle along some side fence (laughs) in a random corner of the park. Longer than any of the attractions or the rides, Z sat at that there puddle and played to his heart's content for almost an hour. His very own vast and limitless ocean. It makes sense why Jesus never underestimated children. After all, children live in a world where they are expected and hopefully encouraged to imagine, right? To dream and pretend that real life puddles are exotic oceans. Skinny little tree branches are a magician's powerful wand, and an old cardboard box is the Millennium Falcon. Using their imagination, children are able to see the possibility of what isn't there, as well as to see the possibility of what is. But then, of course, the dreaded happens, the thing that Peter Pan feared the most. Children grow up and become adults. (laughs) Ew. Instead of dreaming big dreams, they are taught to make five-year plans. 
Instead of experimenting with failure, they are taught to achieve success. Instead of testing boundaries, they are taught to follow the rules. And instead of asking questions, they are taught to find answers. And with that, a puddle goes back to being just a puddle. The stick is just a stick. And that box, well, that box becomes the thing we learn to fit into. We see this in our passage for today from Luke. Now, if we were just deploying our adult minds, we might be tempted to go straight to the final verses of the passage where Jesus poses a question that we all want the answer to, and he gives us an actual answer. What is the kingdom of God like? Well, according to Jesus, it's like a seed that becomes a tree or yeast that becomes some bread. Asked and answered, we've got what we wanted, now we can move on to the next item in our agenda. But if we use the more childlike part of our brains, the more curious part, we would probably start with the verses leading up to our question for the day. If we had some paper and crayons, we might even begin to sketch the portrait of a woman hunched over in the corner, not making a sound, and yet her pain is somehow loud enough to catch Jesus' attention. It's at that point in our imagining that our mouths might curl into a knowing smile because we know, we know what's going to happen next. We know that Jesus just can't help himself. We know that he can't unsee the needless suffering of this precious child of God. We know that he cannot stand by and do nothing, even if it is the Sabbath. And one can only Imagine what happened next. How Jesus sees this woman, calls out to her, heals her. How for the first time in 18 years, she is able to stand up straight and look her Savior in the eye. We can only imagine how she felt. As for what happens next, well, that requires a little less imagination. Here we encounter a real grown up, an expert at damage control. This leader of the synagogue witnesses Jesus blatantly disregarding the Sabbath law, an act of rebellion that cannot go unaddressed, lest everyone else think that they can do the same thing. And so what does he do? He gets into his pulpit and he reminds his congregation of the laws given to them by God on Mount Sinai. After all, who are they without their laws? They are God's people. These are God's rules, and this is the box that God has given them to live in, which means his job is not to question or imagine. His job is to answer and obey. Enter Jesus. Now, any time Jesus enters the scene is when my imagination really starts to kick into gear. Maybe it's because I've spent too much of my life thinking that Jesus was this totally chill, soft-spoken, nothing-ever-gets-to-me kind of guy, which makes sense because that was the box I was taught to put him in. But you see, I did the craziest thing. I read the Bible, and I got to know Jesus for myself. And that is not the Jesus that I see in the Bible. Now, when I read this passage, I imagine that Jesus and the leader of the synagogue are in the midst of an epic rap battle. And Jesus did not come to play. Now, in my mind, the setting is still ancient, but the medium is modern. Jesus and his opponent are both holding microphones as they volley back and forth until Jesus spits a verse that is so fatal that the crowd goes wild. Jesus drops his mic, and then the leader of the synagogue just walks away with his head bowed down in defeat. <laughs> Try reading the Bible that way. It's really fun. <laughs> now, as crazy as that image is, that right there actually shows how limited my imagination is. Because in my mind, what matters is that Jesus wins, right? But for Jesus, what matters is to keep the conversation going. Verse 18, and after all of that, then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? What is the kingdom of God like? Now, what kind of a question is that? 
What kind of a grown-up would ask a question like that? What kind of God would ask a question like that? The answer, of course, to all of those is the same, the best kind. So often when we talk about church and about Jesus and about God, we do what we think is the responsible thing, the adult thing. We reduce the life of faith to a set of questions where there is a right answer and a wrong answer. We put our imaginations on hold and we do the work. We, we read our Bibles and we do the exegesis. We consult experts and determine metrics of success and metrics of righteousness and metrics of salvation. We may not like the box that we are in, but we love the security it provides. Enter Jesus. For instead of giving us a five-year plan, he paints us a big, bold dream. Instead of demanding achievement, he calls for experimentation. Instead of simply following the rules, he tests the boundaries. And instead of giving an answer, he asks a question. What is the kingdom of God like? Not what is the kingdom of God, or let me tell you what the kingdom of God is, or listen up as I confirm to you the exact and precise coordinates of said kingdom of God. Jesus does not give us a right answer or some magical solution or even an elusive destination that we have to spend our whole lives trying to find. No, instead, he extends us an invitation. He brings our attention to small, seemingly insignificant, ordinary mysteries that show us and reassure us that the glimpses of the kingdom of God are all around us if we would only have the imagination to see. If we would only have the imagination to believe. If we would only have the imagination to dream. After all, as our youngest and wisest teachers remind us, imagination enables us to see the possibility of what isn't even there, as well as the possibility in what is. Y'all, that is what Jesus is inviting us to. So again, close your eyes. And now I want you to imagine, to dream what the kingdom of God is like. To what shall we compare it to? Maybe it's like a group of people who are so proud of their God-given Asian culture that they want to share it with their friends at church. Or maybe it's like a church that's so proud of their Asian members that they want to celebrate their culture. Maybe the kingdom of God is like a random street corner in the city of Berkeley where people come every other Saturday morning because they know, they know that in that place, they won't be judged or condescended to. They will just be given food and some kindness. Maybe the kingdom of God is like a little child who loves playing with puddles and sticks and old cardboard boxes, a kid who loves going to church because that's where they get to hear stories about a God whose love for them is unimaginable. And who knows, maybe that little child will grow up into a grown-up, into an adult who is actually okay with not having all the right answers, who is okay with not having the security of a box, but instead trusts that the God of the universe, the God made known to us in Jesus Christ, is not only satisfied with, but delights in their imagination. May it be so. Amen.